Good morning and welcome to the COVID-19 Care Conversation. Happy Aloha Friday. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. We're so happy to bring you this conversation brought to you by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative and Hawaii Pacific Health. Today, Ryan, we have a very special guest to talk to us about changes in the travel industry, really the lifeblood of our economy, and some uh, you know exciting things to share with us about th- changes that have been made. That, of course, is Hawaiian Airlines CEO Peter Ingram. That's right. Excited to talk to him about some of the changes that Hawaiian Airlines uh, is making to accommodate uh, all these restrictions, of course, that we are seeing that are being required now uh, with social distancing. And so we're going to get an update uh, from him about those efforts, as well as, uh, you know, just just sort of the overall plans for Hawaiian Airlines moving forward. Of course, we always like to start off uh, the day by giving you an update on some of the new counts. And again, we saw just two new cases reported yesterday on Thursday for a total of 655 positive cases since the outbreak began. Yeah, and the recovery rate really is remarkable. More than 95 of those who've been infected in the state of Hawaii have now recovered from the virus. We have very low infection rates right now, very low community spread, and so that's great news. And that means tonight, restaurants open for dining, dine-in dine service here on Oahu. Um, I know a lot of business owners are really itching to reopen, but it's going to look a little bit different when you go to eat out. It's also going to look very different when you start to travel. Uh, June 16th is the day that inter island travel begins again, uh, welcoming people from the neighbor islands back to Oahu and letting folks who live here go see family if they have that on the neighbor islands. Joining us to talk about a lot of the changes now is Hawaiian Airlines CEO, Peter Ingram, thank you so much for being here this morning. Tell us a little bit about how you're gearing up for the change. Well, I I think we're ready to go at this point. Um, One of the things that that we've been uh, focused on, we've actually been operating through this period, of course, to carrying essential personnel. So load factors have been very light, but we've been operating five flights to, uh, to each of Maui, Kona, uh, Hilo and Lahue from Honolulu, and we've been flying a couple of flights, uh, three flights right now to the mainland, uh, carrying mainly cargo. Um, so we've been operating, but what we've been doing is uh, assessing our procedures in light of the uh, the new environment we're in. Uh, we, we rolled out a number of things this week that is a product of that with more spacing in the airports. We've got plexiglass on the counters. All of our, uh, our employees will be wearing uh, face coverings. Uh, we're, are, we're requiring uh, passengers to wear face coverings. Um, and uh, we've really taken a look at all of our cleaning procedures. And the, the good news for people who are getting ready to travel is uh, air travel has actually been uh, a very safe environment all along. There's not a lot of indication that people have contracted the disease from being on airplanes. And, and part of that's because we already have uh, a lot of circulation of outside air into the airplane. So it's replaced on a regular basis. There's HEPA filters like you would have in a hospital environment as part of what's on our airplanes. Uh, but we've We've introduced some new measures like this uh, electrostatic fogging, which is the the picture you just had up a moment ago. And what that is, is is, uh, the the disinfectant is um, slightly electronically charged and helps it adhere to surfaces better and provides lasting cleaning. And that's going to be part of our regular cleaning procedures going forward. So we've we've taken a look at everything. We think we're uh, we're ready to go. And and uh, we're, we're excited to be able to welcome people back to traveling without having to worry about a quarantine when they get to the other end of the route. You know, what is sort of the impact? Obviously, this has you know, been a, a hard run for the airlines industry. Uh, how significant has this been for Hawaiian Airlines overall as, as a company? What are some of the things that you folks have had to implement because uh, of this reduced travel and so much restrictions? Well, Economically, this has been as devastating as um, anything uh, that most of us have seen in our lifetimes. And I've been in the airline industry for 25 years now. And certainly this is, uh, in terms of the economic impact, is beyond 9-11. It's beyond the global financial crisis. Um, we, we've got an a, a industry where we can't inventory our product. If we, if the seats we were, were going to be able to produce and sell today aren't sold, uh, 
um, today, we can't put them on a shelf and, and sell them tomorrow. They're gone. And you know, well over ninety percent of our uh, our revenue has disappeared, um, starting in March with with some of the impacts, and then you know April and May are um, completely zero financially. So we've been uh, at Hawaiian Airlines. We've been uh, burning through right now about three million dollars a day in just ongoing um, cash losses. Um, that's uh, that's obviously a staggering number. Uh, it's actually down from about four and a half million dollars a day before. So we have been able to manage our spending down some, uh, but it is uh, e economically it's it's unsustainable for us. And 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 I think that actually parallels the fact that this is economically unstable for the state of Hawaii. Um, so much of our economy relies on tourism to bring in dollars and to help employ people, whether it's in hotels or restaurants and small businesses. And so um, it, it's an incredibly difficult period. We all see it in the unemployment stats and, uh, and hopefully uh, we can get to the other side of this soon and start building back and getting people employed and getting small businesses and our business back up and running. You know, three to four and a half million dollars a day is clearly unsustainable. We talked to Mufi Hanneman yesterday about the hotel piece of this, and he was saying that if it's not up and running by July, he really worries that some hotels will have to close down. Um, how long can you sustain losses like that? It it, it is. I, I certainly agree. We we can't keep going like like this forever. Uh, we have been. Uh, it in our business that we we did have access to some um, some government assistance and that has helped uh, bridge us and and we also uh, we came into this in a strong financial position so we had a, a, a cash balance uh, at the beginning of the year that was about seven hundred million dollars which is more than we normally target to have uh, it was fortunate that that we had that we borrowed uh, more money. Uh, but we, we do have to to get going because that's a borrowed money, and we've got to pay that borrowed money back. And if we if we can't get up and running uh, relatively soon, uh, one of the things I worry about is we're going to have to shrink the airline. And if we shrink the airline, that means we're going to have uh, fewer opportunities to employ people, and we're going to have to um, make some very very difficult decisions. And 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 the longer the longer we are uh, effectively out of business, the harder it gets to recover. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm eager to get going as well. I think, um, you know, July or at the latest, the beginning of August to get things up and running is, is really important for a lot of businesses in the community. And that certainly includes us. We want to bring in some of the questions from those who are tuning in. Um, Cheryl's asking about Las Vegas is opening, so will you be starting that service there soon? Uh, what about restarting services to JFK and Boston? I know a lot will depend on what happens here in the islands with you know the quarantine and what the governor decides, but, but what, what is sort of the plan for restarting some of these routes that were very successful for you folks? So with Las Vegas in particular, we've had this question since, um, since Vegas began opening up this week. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're just really not going to see much demand when people realize that they have to come back and have a 14-day quarantine on, on this end when they return from their trip. And certainly, inbound visitors from Las Vegas are, are not going to come in, in numbers with uh, the quarantine in place. So we don't have any plans to, um, to restart um, Las Vegas or Boston or New York until we get to a point where the quarantine can be removed and, and we can... Uh, bring in a, a volume of, of visitors that, uh, and guests on our airplanes that justifies having uh, the service in place. Uh, Ingrid Peterson is asking, does Hawaiian fly to Japan, Australia, New Zealand, which would probably be the safest trans-Pacific routes op to open first? You know, we've heard a lot of talk recently about these travel bubbles. Love to get your thoughts on that. Could that be the market that Hawaiian shifts to and looks to bring in some more revenue? Well, we did fly to Japan in uh, in March. We were actually, um, you know, second only to Japan Airlines in terms of the volume of seats between Japan and Hawaii. Uh, and we we have served Australia and New Zealand. Obviously, right now we're not serving 
uh, any of those uh, international locations. The only the only place we are flying to is um, Seoul, Korea, three times a week, and we aren't carrying any passengers on those flights. We're only carrying cargo. So so that's a that's a, a cargo opportunity that we have uh, we have carved out amidst this um, this period. Uh, the travel bubble concept is. Um, something we're we're open to discussing, but we really don't think it's uh, it's the solution that's going to get us all the way there for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, um, first of all, for New Zealand and Australia, those markets are are very slow, um, small. The the total volume of, of visitors really only supports uh, a couple of uh, flights a day in in from each of those uh, countries from all the carriers combined, not just Hawaiian. Uh, we were flying three times a week to Auckland before. About half the people on our airplanes were actually connecting to North America. And, uh, and of course, the economic damage in Australia and New Zealand has been severe as well. So we would expect those to be limited opportunities, not to say we're not going to go back, but I, I don't think that is going to allow any hotels to reopen or uh, other uh, businesses to, um, to start up. Japan is is a little bit different. It's about it represents about fifteen percent of the visitors um, that traveled to Hawaii before uh, the crisis, and so th there there may be some limited opportunity in Japan. Uh, but but again, there there will be a lot of hotels I think that still won't open based on that small subset of the market. Um, the the other challenge with uh, with the bubbles is. Um, that people globally talking about travel bubbles are, are really typically talking about one sovereign nation negotiating with another sovereign nation on the terms for that. And, and of course, Hawaii is, is a state. We're part of the United States. And so um, there's a lot of complexities to dealing with the federal government regulation. And our industry is, uh, is really governed federally more so than we are by the state or by uh, by local governments. So I, I worry that people putting a lot of faith in travel bubbles as the solution is going to, to um, distract us from what, what I think we really need to do, which is thinking about what are the protocols and conditions and procedures that we need to have in place um, so that we can ensure that it's safe for people to travel and so that we can ensure that our community is going to be protected. And to there, there will be some risk, of course. There, there's one of the, even if um, we think airplanes are safe for people to travel in, and we absolutely do, um, it, it is the fact that we carry people between different places. And so if we're bringing someone from a place where there is more of the disease in the environment and they're coming here, they're bringing that virus um, with them. Uh, and part of the solution to that is, is actually not in our control. It's really more the Department of Health and the hospital system is due to the extent that we do have some small uptick in cases as we open up, are we able to deal with it in terms of hospital capacity in terms of being able to care for people in terms of having contact tracing in place. And the one of the differences between where we are now and where we were in March, is in March, this was hitting us like a tsunami. And we didn't know anything about this disease. We didn't um, have uh, ideas about how to care for, for people and how to um, treat people who had it. The contact tracing resources weren't built up. One of the things I I'm, I'm hopeful of is that uh, in the healthcare community, we've made the use of the time since then um, to build our resources, get PPE for the hospital workers, make sure that that we're in a position um, to manage some volume of cases if they come better than we were at the beginning of this when, when we, we couldn't have been prepared. We didn't know uh, what uh, this disease was all about. You know, one of the other questions we had is just about uh, configurations and, and seating, because we do know that there is some social distancing that needs to happen. Uh, of course, uh, those sorts of elements will have to be implemented within the plane as well. So seating capacity might uh, impact that arrangements as well. Uh, can you speak to that, as, you know, especially on some of maybe the neighbor island flights where the planes are a little smaller? Um, how are you folks adjusting to the uh, configurations and seating? 
Sure. It's a, it's a great question. And one, you know, we've been thinking about and airlines around the world have been thinking about, um, it, airplanes are, are, you know, really not conducive to having six feet of distance between people. E- even if you have an empty seat in between seats are typically 18 inches wide and 18 inches, is a lot less than six feet. Uh, but w- what we have done is said, well, you know, what, what can we do in that environment to provide more space? And, uh, and what we've done on our uh, airplanes is we, we've blocked our middle seats um, for, for the time being. We have limited the overall capacity. So uh, even on the 717, that is a, a two, three configuration, two seats on one side, three on the other. Um, there's, uh, we're, we're making sure that no, uh, the middle seats are, are empty and Overall, we're, we just won't sell beyond a 70% load factor. So, so there, will, there will always be 30% of the seats uh, empty for the time being on those airplanes. Long term, that's, that's not going to be um, sustainable for us or for other airlines uh, unless we can um, charge an awful lot more than the market has typically borne for prices because you know our, our fixed costs are are still the same whether we sell 95% of the seats or 60 or 70 percent of the seats uh, but in in the interest of getting things moving I th- and giving people comfort with traveling again that's what that's what we've done and some some other uh, uh, airlines have done I, I'd reiterate again though that um, even when we were flying full flights in March and other airlines were flying full flights, airplanes proved relatively safe. And because even if you're not six feet apart, you're also not face to face. You're sitting side by side. People are generally not expressing themselves uh, in the, the, the way you might at a, a community gathering or a, a party or a concert. Um, often you just put your noise canceling headseats, headphones on and you, uh, you chill out for a little bit and stay to yourself. And the air circulation certainly helps with that. So, uh, we're, we're doing what we can on distancing, uh, but we're also relying on some of those other sort of features that were already in place on the airplanes. Lieutenant Governor Josh Green was on this program last week, and he said one of his concerns was that if we open up and then have to do another rapid shutdown like we saw in March, uh, where we put on all these restrictions for a company like Hawaiian Airlines, and he cited your your company specifically, he said that that could put you out of business. What are your thoughts on that? Is that true? Well, it, it, it's certainly something that, that would be very difficult for, for us to overcome, and I think a lot of businesses. And, and I, I mentioned earlier, we, we came into 2020 uh, very strong financially. We've worked very hard over the last, you know, really 10 or 15 years that I've been at Hawaiian. We've worked very hard to strengthen our business and have a strong balance sheet. And the, the, the sad thing for us is that all that hard work to put the company in a strong financial position has been destroyed over about a two month period by um, something that that was not caused by our employees. It was it was just an external natural phenomenon. Um, so it's important for us to get back up and running again. If we had to go through, if we started back up and had to go through that again, our ability to go out and uh, borrow money as we did a couple of months ago and to access the capital markets and to get government support, that may not be there again. And we may not have the financial resilience to be able to sustain as we have during this period. You know, one of the things, of course, that we're seeing many companies do during this time is just be able to support the community. And of course, Hawaiian Airlines, uh, we saw has has been a part of that uh, in some of those efforts in getting masks to the neighbor islands and things like that. Can you speak to uh, the things that you guys have done sort of in this time uh, to help give back to the community? Because we know that there has been a lot of things that you guys have actually partnered in, despite all the challenges that you guys have faced, uh, there, there's still a lot of things that you guys were doing. Yeah, you, you know, as as dark as this period has uh, been for all of us, one of the real beacons of inspiration for um, for me and for our leadership team has been our employees. They are they are absolutely fantastic, and it's been incredible to see the things that they have done for each other and and for their community. Uh, You mentioned um, bringing masks in. We flew a 
uh, a flight to um, Shenzhen, China, uh, on behalf of uh, a local um, nonprofit group um, who organized to the purchase of, I think it was 1.6 million um, face masks. Um, flying, flying the airplane was actually um, the easy part. It took um, several weeks of preparation from people from a variety of, of different departments to work through the government approvals. We had never flown to Shenzhen before. Um, and, uh, you know, we hadn't, we weren't uh, operating to China uh, before this. We had up till 2018, but some of our businesses' licenses had expired. All of that work had to be done. And so uh, it was uh, department after department needed to get involved to get that done and then bring those masks back safely and get them to, um, to the, uh, uh, the nonprofit organization to be distributed throughout the islands. Uh, we've had our team Kokua, which is our uh, volunteer group of employees that, that um, organizes events on an ad hoc basis all the time. This is not something we've just put together now, but they've worked with, um, with the food bank and, uh, and Meals on Wheels to deliver food to, uh, to Kapuna, who um, you know, obviously needed to um, shelter and stay safe, particularly early in this crisis. We've participated in, um, in some of the, um, the food uh, giveaways for people, including our own employees who, are, uh, who have taken voluntary leaves and are, and are no longer Longer working and needed access to food, so um, the people have done such a terrific job. And then, and then within the company, people have had to do these uh, incredible things, often stepping outside their normal day-to-day -day, uh, roles because um, we we just needed something done in a period of time, and people just stepped up and and did it. And one of the examples was in March when we were canceling flights at such a rapid pace. Our, uh, our phone lines were becoming uh, overwhelmed. We just didn't have enough reservations uh, agents to answer those calls. And we, we put out a call for volunteers. Uh, within uh, a matter of days, we had set up uh, a whole separate reservations um, desk, just ad hoc here in our offices. And, and people took calls and, and expedited that. And there's, I could go on and on with the, the stories of heroism from our team. It's really been um, so heartwarming for me to see. We saw a couple of questions in here. I know this is, you know, we went from big picture to now this is, uh, but, but people have some practical questions just wanting to know about refunds. And I know you talked about those reservation agents that you uh, had step up all those volunteers. Um, what is the policy as people start to decide that they do feel comfortable traveling, um, but they might be apprehensive because they worry about the return policy. Has that changed at all? And, and how can people feel confident when they book? Yeah, so so uh, a couple of things. First of all, on on refunds, if if we uh, if we don't operate a flight, we cancel it, and we can't reaccommodate you on uh, on a different flight within uh, a matter of hours. Um, we will provide refunds. Uh, if people want to change, uh, we will we will do that with flight credits for flights that are existing. And right now, we've got a a change waiver out, so there are no change fees. If you buy a ticket today. Uh, and you decide um, two weeks from now you don't want to fly or your circumstances have, have changed, um, you can um, change that with no change fee, have a flight credit to use on, on another flight. So we, we want people to be able to book with confidence. Okay. Great. Well, Peter, thank you so much. We know that you are a busy man, and we just appreciate you taking the time to uh, sort of give us an update and answering questions from uh, some of the viewers that are, that are tuning in. Uh, any final thoughts that you have before we say uh, goodbye to you? Well, I just want to say thank you guys for, for getting uh, information out to, uh, to the community. Um, I, I'm feeling uh, better these days that we've done such a great job in our community of flattening the curve that I, I think we do have um, the opportunity to begin um, restarting economic activity. And I know some of that has uh, has begun and, and I look forward to us um, continuing to expand that in a way that uh, that really makes sure we're taking care of the, the needs and concerns of our community as we're doing it. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to, to getting started and getting back to, you know, closer to some regular business. It'll be a new normal, but uh, but we, we want to get back to some some form of normal at least. 
We are all hoping to get there. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday. Peter Ingram, CEO of Hawaiian Airlines. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, interesting, um, especially about, I mean, interesting, of course, we've seen some of those pictures that Ryan, you put up about, you know, the cleaning protocols and how flights will be different, eliminating the middle row for now and uh, operating basically at a max 70% capacity, but also about the harsh realities going from 4.5 now to $3 million losses every day. Um, they're burning through that $700 million of reserves that he talked about. Um, but you see that they are putting up a fight. They are trying their best to make sure that they stay in business and keep all of the people who are here in Hawaii employed because this is such an important uh, resource for us here in the islands. Um, also talking about how really that mainland piece has to come in that the travel bubble doesn't sound like it's going to be enough. Yeah, I mean, it, that was an interesting to point because I think a lot of people were talking about the travel bubble and, and putting a lot of stock into that. And, and while it will be good to get some of those visitors back, uh, it, be, it was interesting to hear just the capacity and the numbers wise about what they'd see on that daily basis and how even if they bring back those travel bubble segments, um, that it might not just be enough. Uh, just a few flights a day, 15% uh, is what he said from Japan, as well as the loads that were coming in from New Zealand and Australia. Uh, while it will be good to have you know a few flights, it, it's just not enough to sustain, of course, what we are used to seeing uh, from West Coast travel and beyond in, in the mainland. So uh, great to hear from him on that as well. Yeah, and Hawaiian Airlines doing so much to lift up the community, flying in masks, and he, as he said, you know, really trying to help when, wherever they can. Uh, Timothy Walker saying the only solution is to open Hawaii. Well, we're going to be asking Governor Ige about that on Monday. He'll be joining us once again. Um, he's become a Monday regular, and we really appreciate his time. We definitely want to get an update now that we know that June 16th is, is neighbor island travel. The, the big question is when can we welcome uh, visitors from the mainland and how do we do that successfully and safely? I know Ryan, you and I were talking about this earlier. We saw those pictures now that Las Vegas casinos has open, have opened. Not a lot of people look like they're wearing masks in those casinos, kind of a mix and certainly not social distancing. So how do we do this safely? We're gonna be asking the governor about that on Monday. Yeah, we know a lot of people love going to Las Vegas and just waiting for the opportunity to get back there to Hawaii's ninth island. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how Hawaii sort of uh, regulates sort of the travel coming back from there. Of course, we've heard a, a bunch of different proposals from the Lieutenant Governor as well. So uh, we know that that is going to be a destination a lot of people are going to be looking forward to going back to. So how do we keep Hawaii safe uh, with all those things that are happening, of course, as Vegas opens up as well. So we'll get an update on that. Uh, also interested to talk to him about some of the other news that came out yesterday in that, uh, of course, we know that gyms and theaters were given the green light, but bars were also added to that list of reopening on June 19th. Uh, it was pr uh, approved by Governor Ige and, of course, initially proposed by Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell to reopen some of those other establishments. There have been uh, a large call for some of those bars and other indoor attractions uh, such as bowling alleys, arcades and mini golf, movie theaters, museums, all of those will be allowed to reopen on the 19th. Uh, there is still that question of how do you maintain social distancing in bars? The mayor saying that they may be looking for the liquor commission to sort of step in and help to regulate that because he was saying that HPD is already just stretched so thin with trying to regulate everything else. They're not going to be able to be going into these bars to make sure that people are maintaining that you know social distancing and that the bars are adhering to those guidelines. So uh, we'll see what happens there and, and how they're able to uh, sort of negotiate through this. Yeah, that'll be very interesting to talk about. And we'd love to hear from you. What do you want to ask the governor? And do you feel comfortable? Um, today, of course, is when restaurants are opening. Are you going out for, for dinner tonight? It's been a while since we've all been out to eat. Um, what does that look like? We'd love to hear from you. And if you do go out to dinner, tell us about it on Monday. Um, the other thing that reopens today is the Honolulu Zoo. I know a lot of families are excited about that. It's going to look a little different. Um, they do you know, they're opening on a smaller scale, limited hours. They're expecting people to wear masks. Children five and under obviously don't need to wear a mask, but um, any kids older than that do need to be wearing a mask. So, uh, but one little note here that the ring two ringtail baby lemurs were born April 18th. Um, there they are. So you can go see them in person and it'll be great for, um, you know, families to be able to enjoy what is such a an activity that is enjoyed by so many. A uh, few areas won't be open, but it looks like it's going to be a nice place for families to get out of the house and go see a, go see those baby lemurs.
That's right. And of course, we like to always end our segment by highlighting the Hawaii hero of the day. Uh, and uh, this time we have uh, another hero that we want to highlight here on this Aloha Friday. Yeah, Collaborative Support Services is facilitating funds for the Nest Hui. That's a group focused on 300 families with young children, uh, helping them get through the COVID-19 crisis. So each of those 300 is provided with positive parenting tips, activity connected to support, and they are referred to different support for things like breastfe breastfeeding, postpartum distress, risk for child abuse or neglect, intimate partner violence, substance abuse, and other things. So, you know, check them out. They're wonderful. Um, of course, the Collaborative Services and all of their partners put this together. They're a grantee of the Hawaii Community Foundation's Resilience Fund. We again say mahalo to Hawaii Community Foundation for all that they are doing doing for our community. So great to see the Nest Hui collaborate. Uh, a little switch, switching technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, Want to let you know also that uh, major food distribution at Aloha Stadium is happening uh, next Tuesday. Head to hawaiifoodbank.org to get the full details. Um, but that'll be, you know, what we've seen in the past where the vehicles can line up and then get a substantial amount of food to feed your family. That's right. And again, next week, we are looking forward to catching up once again with Governor David Ige. We also have our Ask the Doctor that will be here as well, as well as talking to UH Athletics Director Dave Matlin about some of the changes that are happening on the athletic standpoint and Hawaii Athletics. So uh, another week to look forward to. Again, we want to thank everybody for entering your questions here today and for being a part of this conversation. Yeah, we mahalo Hawaii, uh, Hawaii Executive Collaborative and Hawaii Pacific Health. Thank you to all of you for all that you're doing to flatten the curve. Remember, as you head out this weekend and you enjoy life getting a little closer to what it once was, wear those masks, socially distance, wash your hands, do all the things so that we stay in this great position that we have been for so long now. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you right back here with the Governor 1030 on Monday. Aloha.